Hi there YouTubers and uh, welcome to another episode of Air Gunning for Beginners and uh, um, I'm hoping you enjoy the series. Uh, it seems that uh, the comments are, are proving that this is actually quite uh, useful to some of you guys out there. Thank you for the comments and as always please keep them coming. So um, this episode is really is a basic episode. Um, it may seem a bit weird what I'm about to do. Well, I'm actually going to go through the parts of air rifles. Um, yes, I'm going to say that's a trigger. Yes, I'm going to say that's a barrel. But I'm also going to go a little bit into some of the terminologies there and some of the extra bits. Um, some of the things that you're going to notice a lot of the times when you're asking for advice or in the forums and somebody might turn around and say, well, what you need to do is make sure you've got a dovetail with high rise mounts to put your scope on and you're going to go, oh, what does all that mean? So, um, apologies if some of this is a bit too basic, but um, we'll go along and we'll see how we go. Now I've got one, two, three, four air rifles here and an air pistol. Um, and I think I've got quite a bit of this covered. Um, at least one of the rifles will have something I'm talking about. But for the ones that I haven't, I will probably end up just putting a few little pictures up in the video for you to see. So, um, without any further ado, uh, what we'll do is we'll I'll crack on straight onto it. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use this little springer that I've got here, and you would have seen this probably in one of my other videos. This is a BSA, uh, it's a 2 2 springer. Now, the typical air rifles you're going to see, as we've talked about in other videos, are your 1.177 caliber and your 0 .22. Those are the two typical ones you're going to see. Um, you can see other ones such as 2.5 up to 30 caliber, and if you're in the States, they love. Um, shooting tank shells at each other with 50 calibre, but typically it's going to be 17722. So, this is a 22, and as we know, it is a spring air rifle. And uh, before all these safety nuts go on, all of these rifles are unloaded. Okay, so let's keep it quite simple. Um, and what I've got is I've got a double camera set up here. So, sometimes um, what I'll do is I'll sort of move from one camera to another one. Um, I'm just trying to get this video so that you can actually see some close ups of it. But, um, so what we've got here is if we take a look at the back end, effectively we have a butt plate. Now your butt plates will vary between many different rifles. Um, this one is a rubberized, pretty much they're all rubberized. Um, and this one has actually got vent holes in and if we just push it to the side on that camera, we can see we've got vent holes in there. And the idea is that, is that it fits nicely into your shoulder and so that it takes some of the recoil with springers. PCPs don't have any recoil on them, but it's really to get it nice and into your shoulder. Now most of these butt plates, and you can see on this camera here, you can actually um, take the butt plates off and replace them with something of your own choosing. Quite a lot of rifles will actually have butt plates, some of the more expensive ones where you can actually move these butt plates up and down, even tilt them, cant them side to side to give you that perfect, perfect fit. So that's pretty much butt plates, bit boring, but it's useful to know. Okay, so if we move down a bit more, what we actually have is the main body of the rifle is the stock. Okay, and you'll get these in many different formats and in many beautiful designs, which generally can also up the cost of the rifle. Many of the most expensive rifles out there have beautiful pieces of woodmanship in them. So the three sort of typical stocks you're gonna get are basically Synthetic, so this is a plastic stock made out of one piece plastic, very rugged, um, typically in black and typically called tactical. So if you see anyone saying that this is a tactical rifle, the chances are it's basically saying it looks military, it's black, it must be called, cool, therefore it's tactical. That's pretty much marketing for you. But this is what they call a tactical type of stock on here. And we can see that stock there. Now generally, like we said, they're all one piece. And nine times out of ten, these stocks can be removed by the means of a couple of screws. So one of the screws on this one is underneath the trigger area here. And there's a couple of screws up here. So these stocks can be removed so you can get out the metal working parts of the rifle. So if we take a look at another rifle. So let's pick up which one shall we have. Yeah. We'll come up with this big bad boy here. So this is the uh, Air Arms um, uh, 420 S420 420, and you can see we've got a beautiful nice wooden stock um, and generally what you're going to get in stocks is you're going to get them in two types of wood and that'll be walnut and beech. You can get them in many many different um, types as well but those are the two typical ones you're going to get. Um, 
and slightly sort of darker colours on them. And you'll find that these stocks are all moulded. So you can see how this stock here is moulded, beautiful moulding on here. Um, and this is basically here is the cheek piece. So this is the part that you rest, so if we turn to the side here, that you rest your cheek against and it's moulded for your cheek. And what you'll hear people say is left or right handed rifles. Well, basically this cheek piece is designed for a right handed person to lean against. If I was to shoot this left handed, I'd have this sharp piece in here and it is not comfortable. So you'll hear a lot of people say that this rifle is ambidextrous, can be shot left or right handed. But when they say that, it's got one of these cheek pieces in it. So typically what you're going to need to do is actually make sure you get a left or right handed one. Quite a lot of the times that's just clever marketing. Basically they say this is an ambidextrous rifle, in other words we manufacture it in left or right handed stocks. So be very careful on that, especially on the cheek pieces on here because of it is not very comfortable to try and shoot one of these the wrong way round, especially if it's got a raised part on like that. Okay, so we've gone there with the, the stock itself. So there we go, we've got the stock. So we've gone down that part. Um, obviously on top, I'm not going to insult your intelligence, but we have the barrel. And we can see the barrel here. And your barrels obviously will be your varying lengths. So here's a barrel on this one. We can see this barrel is actually quite a bit longer uh, than on the Springer. Um, and it's this, this is what's called a floating barrel. The reason it's called a floating barrel is that you can see this gap. Now this one is actually floating and suspended. Um, so it's sort of like braced here. But if I grab another rifle, and this is the beautiful thing about having so many rifles around, Let's bring this bad boy up, which is our cricket, and we can see that this barrel on the top is totally floating above. And that's done for accuracy reasons, so that there's no vibrations in the barrel when the pellet is travelling down, down the barrel, and it's trying to keep things nice and accurate. So you'll see this is a very, very common trait, a floating barrel down the top. Moving forward, we then get basically silencers or modifiers or mufflers, whatever you want to call them. Now in some countries these are illegal, um, in the UK we're pretty safe at the moment on here. And the whole purpose of the muffler is to reduce the noise, the crack of the rifle when it's fired. To make it quieter, uh, so that basically you can plink in your backyard with more ease, without disturbing the neighbours and of course without disturbing more of the wildlife on there. Now most rifles actually nowadays come with a built-in muffler, so this one's got one on here and if we take a look at the Springer it has a muffler on here and for example if again if we bring the bullpup back up we can see the, mod, uh, the muffler on the bullpup. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cock the bullpup and we've got no pellets in here and it's nice and safe and we're just going to fire it and listen and we can hear that. What I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to take the muffler off this one and most mufflers just basically are screw on, screw off. So here's the muffler off this one and now we can actually see the length of the barrel on this rifle and we'll come on to ball pops a little bit later but that is the actual barrel itself and let's cock this and try again. Makes a hell of a difference. So we'll just put this back on and we'll do that again. So we can just tell straight away the reason for having that on there. So we put this muffler back on, we'll cut the rifle and do it again, and we can tell straight away. So always check to see whether or not the rifle's got a muffler on it, um, whether it's got an aftermarket, especially if you buy a second hand, um, they might have taken it off, they might have not supplied it to you, they might be keeping it themselves. A lot of people get very attached to the mufflers, the silencers. Quite a lot of rifles will also, with a built-in muffler, also have an attachment on the end that you can unscrew. So this is on my Springer, and we'll just show that in this camera, and we see on here, comes off where you can attach a secondary muffler or silencer on there. So you can have extensions of mufflers to quieten it even more, um, and this Springer is quite loud. Putting an extra muffler on it probably will quieten it down a little bit more, but I haven't done that. So that covers mufflers on there. Okay, so let's now move on to rails. 
um, and go to the top of the rifle. So you can see here that where my rifle, this rifle here has a scope fitted on top of it. Um, telescopic scope help me with um, targeting. It has to be attached to the rifle somehow. And there are two major ways. There are many other ways of doing it, but these are the two common ones you're gonna see. One is called dovetail. So we'll bring this close into this camera and we can see that this here is a dovetail. So basically it's like a wedge of metal that the scope itself just clamps into. So we can see that on here, if we just look in there, that basically the rail slides over the top and this is about 22 millimeters across. The scope slides over the top, you then tighten it down with two sets of bolts and that is nice and sturdy and will not come off. If we take a look at uh, this rifle here, which again is the air arms, we can see exactly the same going on there. This is a dovetail system. The scope then basically sits on, it clamps on like so, and you can slide it on and you can actually slide it up and down into the position that you want it to actually allow you then to put the scope exactly where you want it. So that's one type of rail system. The other type of rail system is, typically that you'll see is one called Picatinny. And this may confuse the hell out of a lot of people, but let's see how we can show this a bit better. I don't really want to take the scope off here, but we can see that it's a bit wider, um, and this is more military looking. You'll see these on military uh, rifles. It really came from the American Army as a universal way of fitting and attaching scopes. And basically it looks a little bit like a dovetail, but you can see like these tram tracks in here. Um, and they're set at a default thickness for Picatinny. And basically what happens is that when you put the scope on, in this case it's difficult to do on camera, but when you put the scope on we've got some bolts that we tighten down and clamp it on. And basically the bolts will actually attach themselves into these track rails and that stops the scope from moving backwards and forwards when it's fired. Stops what we call slippage and slippage is the scope will creep backwards and forwards along here and of course mess up your aiming and your zeroing on there. So the next thing we're looking for is, we've already sort of mentioned it there, but that was a scope. Quite a lot of rifles nowadays come with no actual sights on them. No sights, excuse me, no sights on them. So you see this rifle has no metal sights, what we call iron sights, which are your normal sights. So for example, let me show you, this is the only example I've got of this, um, it's a pistol. And we see this little lump on the front, that is basically the front iron sight. Called iron because it's made of iron, it's not really iron but it's metal, it's, it's an old term, iron sight. And there'll be an equivalent like V shape at the back, which you see on the old typical um, World War um, II movies where they're sort of like got this like long thing at the back which they're looking through, you've probably seen it in the COD, uh, Call of Duty games where you're looking through the sight. That's exactly how they work, so you'd have sights on there. You'll find nowadays though that a lot of rifles will not come with any sights whatsoever and you have to fit a scope on. So when you're looking to buy a rifle, a second hand rifle, you need to be thinking, do I want iron sights? Yes I do want iron sights. Do I want to use a scope? Yes, then that determines what type of scope, what type of rail system. Will the scope impede with the sights? lots of things to think about but typically you'll see nowadays like I said you generally have to put a scope on so that's that side of things okay so let's now move down and what we then have is the working mechanisms of the actual rifle itself we have safety catch now <laughs> believe it or not all the rifles I've got this is the only one with a safety catch your safety catch could be operated in many different ways sometimes it's a little simple flip switch like so, let's just bring it to this camera so you can see, little flip switch. Sometimes it is a switch in front of the trigger, sometimes it's a push button, it varies from rifle to rifle if it's got a safety catch on it. And typically what the safety catch will do is lock the trigger so that you can't actually pull the trigger with the safety catch on. And sometimes it's as simple as a piece of metal just jamming in front of the trigger, sometimes it's more complicated than that. On a Springer, there's not really that much more apart from breaking the barrel, putting the pellet in, closing it, safety and firing. So I think we're almost done with that Springer. In fact, we'll need it for one more thing in a minute. 
Let's bring up a PCP, and I want to use this one because of it has got a iPod on it and it makes life so much easier. The next thing you'll notice then is on most of your PCPs, um, you will have, in fact all of them, you will have some form of bolt mechanism to cycle the shot or to push the pellet into the barrel. So obviously these can be on the left hand side or the right hand side, but basically there are a bolt mechanism that you can pull backwards and forwards. Now, most PCPs that you're going to come across are going to be magazine felt, uh, fed. So you can see, we in this, in this case here, on this uh, Daystate PH6, this is a fixed magazine that you side load in, and there's a video on that if you want to have a look at it. And there's your bolt mechanism here, so basically, you pull your bolt, you fire your shot, you pull your bolt, Shot. And you can see that this rifle's actually got a muzzler, a silencer on it. And that's actually very loud, compared to the one that we did previously. But that's your, basically your breech, your loading mechanisms. Uh, you'll hear it called all sorts, you'll hear it called de-action. Basically it's the action, the mechanisms of the rifle itself on there. So let's just show you a slightly different example of how that works. So again, what we do is we'll pick up our bullpup. And... We look at the bullpup and we can see that this is actually laid out quite different. Um, but we'll go into the bullpup in a second. So what we do is here, instead of a bolt, now we have a lever. We pull the lever, pull it forward, um, and we're just going to aim that down on the floor. Fire, pull the bolt, and fire. And this one comes with magazines. That look like so, 14 shot magazines. And you'll find that most of these rifles will come with magazines anywhere from six, all the way up to 14, 18 shot magazines. So it really does depend on the actual air rifle itself, the make and where you get them from. But you can see they pretty much operate in the same way. You have a cycling system, basically a cocking mechanism for cycling the magazine, to push the pellet into the pair, into the barrel. You have a trigger and that fires the shot. Okay, also what we'll have a look at is the actual trigger itself. Now you'll get many, many different types of trigger and this is a personal taste. This trigger here is solid metal. I do recommend that you get something with a solid metal trigger. Some of them, cheap nasty ones, are plastic. But a nice thick wide trigger. So this has got a really nice wide, I don't know if we can make that out there. It's a nice bladed, nice blade on there. Um, uh, that you can get your finger around nicely, it fits comfortable, and you can pull it. And you hear this thing called two-stage. What is a two-stage trigger? Well, let me try to demonstrate. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cock this rifle, and I'm just going to very gently just move this trigger, and we can see that I can actually move it just back here to take the slack up, and it's not firing. I'm just hitting a slight bit of resistance, and I don't know if we can see that. I'll try and do it. And this one, so we'll just take this, Trigger and um, try to see over, and I just move it slightly, and we can see that's moving slightly, and I'm just hitting a bit of resistance. That is stage one trigger. So basically, what you do is you set yourself up, you line up, you take in the slack on the trigger till you feel that slight resistance, and then when you pull past that resistance is when the shot happens, and that's the second stage. So first stage, slight bit of resistance, pull, second stage. And the whole point of that is to give you a nice consistent pressure and release on the trigger when you're shooting. There's nothing worse than firing a rifle that's got only one stage. There's not many of them out there. That's one stage trigger and basically, pull, pull, and off it goes. There is no build up, there's no control or anything like that. And you'll find that most of these rifles are adjustable. Um, and usually through an access hole, or sometimes in this case with this bad boy you've actually got to take the stock off and start playing with some linkages. But basically these triggers you can adjust at least two parts of them. So that would be for example how much is in the first stage and then how much pressure is needed to pull the actual second stage to fire the shot off. So that's what was generally called a, um, a fully adjustable two-stage trigger. So if you hear that term, that's all it is. Nothing to be scared of, and you'll find that it is pretty common in most of the, of the rifles you see. Um, what else have we got? I've got my little crib sheet here to try and see that we've got everything. Um, yes, um, swivel links. 
<laughs> now, believe it or not, again, this is the only rifle I have that has swivel links on it. Swivel links, what are they? Basically, the little attachments on the bottom, usually one front, one back, and we just about make these out here, and they allow you to attach, basically, pieces of metal that swivel, hence the reason they're called swivel attachments, that allow you to fit accessories, or normally a sling. So if you're out hunting, you can sling the rifle over your shoulder, and it's easy to carry, it's not so heavy. But there is also another use for these swivel attachments. And you can use these swivel attachments not only to put slings on, but you can use them to fit on bipods as well. So this bipod basically clips over the top of it, hooks into the swivel attachment, you twist it on, twist it off, and you tighten it up, and now you have a bipod. Um, this type of bipod is called a Harris bipod, basically based on springs that you can pull back and pull those springs and then you can put the springs back out as well so that is attached onto the swivel mount on there back to the old VSA this didn't it's got no swivels and the owner was actually drilled in and self-tapped in a self-tapping swivel on there so then he could then let put it on a custom bipod so if your rifle doesn't come with swivels don't worry too about it it doesn't mean you can't put a bipod or anything on there you can fit pretty much any railing system that you want. And in fact, on the bullpup itself, this one did not come with a Picatinny on the bottom. And all I did was took the stock off, brought a Picatinny rail off eBay, two drills, two, self, uh, two drill holes, self-tapped in this Picatinny rail, which then gives me the functionality that I wanted. So, that, I think, pretty much covers everything. I wanted to go through. Like I said, some of it sounds extremely basic, uh, but a lot of people are just never told this simple information. And when you're trying to read threads, learn about it, and people are throwing these acronyms at you and talking about this and that, you don't really know what's going on. Uh, so hopefully this video is just like a glossary and an appendix to help you. You know, it's like one of those uh, uh, witch magazines. Um, do you want to learn how to use your iPad? Um, here is a glossary of all the terms and in there it says keyboard. But some people don't know what it is. So um, hopefully this video has been a bit of use. Uh, it's totally unscripted. I think I've covered my notes that I've put down. I'm not 100% sure. I don't know how much blabbling I've done. I don't know how much repeating I've done. But um, fingers crossed you like it. And if you do, please sub. And of course we'll see you on the next set of videos. Because uh, I think this newbie series is going to grow quite a bit into quite a lot of different videos. So uh, thank you very much, don't forget to share and like and see you on the next video.